Hi there, and welcome to a new Impact Talks episode. Today we have Camilla Arndal Anderson with us. She's a neuroscientist with a focus on food. I'm really excited to have some someone with that kind of expertise here. Please introduce yourself to the people, and what do you do? Well, you just said it. I'm a neuroscientist that works with food. So um, that really means I have a background in, in neuroscience. That was a doctorate I did understanding the taste sensations so that's really the processing in the brain which i did using eeg so that's short for electroencephalography electro and encephalo means brain and graphy that's that's the visualization so that's my background which and yeah which i use now in iff international flavor and frequencies so that's really looking at what what is it and how do we process the food and the beverages that we eat every day and we I think most people they don't even think about how how they're processed in the brain right we just eat and we enjoy we drink and we enjoy but how does this actually happen how does it go from molecule to an aroma and molecule to a taste and the physical touch to actually the sensation of touch and that is what I'm trying to understand I remember at uh, one of our events, we had a startup focused on, on this uh, branch. And I feel like the applications are so unlimited. You can, you know, create personal chef experiences. You can use it in gastronomy, like three star Michelin restaurants. But you can also just uh, get more out of your food. Uh, so I guess my question to you is, you've been in this industry for very long. You've studied this. What are practical applications that you are working on that kind of will contribute to or what you're doing currently well i think starting just fundamentally could we understand how we sense food like i mean if we could understand that we could potentially make a sweetener that actually tastes good without any side off taste you know all of them when you buy light products there's always something off right it's it's not the same as when you you purchase the calorie dense versions so can we actually understand how we go from the again the molecules the physical sensations to how we perceive things because if we can understand that link then we can perhaps in the future we can make those uh, foods and beverages such that they taste like the the true calorie version right that's really one application where that's the gold mine and the dream at the end. I'm not sure we'll get there. And, and then there's other applications, which is understanding what is it we actually like? What is it we actually want? And to understand that better, because I mean, it sounds silly, but if I ask you, I give you a beverage and I ask you whether you like it, that's actually a difficult question because well, do I like it or don't I like it? Am I just sitting in a, in a nice couch and that's why I like it? Or is it actually the beverage that's doing something nice to me? I, uh, I like what you, what you said about, you know, the practical application in the future, which means you would have these foods that are less calorie dense yet provide the same pleasure. I'm thinking of like Nutella or something. Right. Like if that. we could do that, that would uh, be brilliant. Yeah. But um, whenever whenever I make the comparison that is out now, like let's say you have Coca Cola and then you drink like Coca Cola Zero. I mean, some people love it. I cannot stand the Zero version. I love the normal version, even though I, I barely drink them nowadays. Um, but it's just not comparable to me. I guess my question is, and I have to ask this for most of my friends: um, How close or how realistic are we? Uh, to getting to a point where there's like a pill that has all the nutrients and calories uh, and all the tastes, like you said, like less calorie dense and all the tastes. Uh, and, and just you take this pill at lunch, like breakfast, lunch, dinner, and you're, you're done. Uh, how close are we to that? Is that even realistic? Yeah, so I think there's two elements there. That's one element that what nutrition do we need? And can we create a pill that gives the nutrition you need. And then maybe it doesn't even matter too much whether that tastes nice if you just need to, to eat it. And that's not too much what I've worked with, to be honest. But so I, so I don't know quite where we are there. I'm more in the, well, how does it then taste? Uh, and, and what kind of joy does it give you uh, while you eat it? And are we there yet? Not at all. 
I mean, and, and to give you an impression, then um, just the sense of taste, right? So that's the sense with the sweet, bitter, umami, salty, and uh, sour. I think that was the five ones. But I mean, we still don't know whether fat is a taste. We don't know whether starch is a taste. There's also a kukumi taste that's, that's being proposed. Is that a taste? We don't know specifically where in the brain tastes are detected. We don't know specifically what types of taste receptors there are. Um, maybe now again back to the calorie talk. Why is it that, that the sweeteners often have a bitter off taste and we can't quite uh, make the sweetness taste the same as sugar? Is that because we have some receptor we haven't found yet? Right? So there are still tons of questions. So actually, I think, uh, so when you say, when are we going to be there? Well, then we first need to answer all of these questions here. And we're really just scratching the surface. I think this surprises a lot of people was just a sense of taste. And well, we've understood that. But no, we haven't at all. I, I actually was not aware that we were so early in the research. Uh, we've actually had you know multiple scientists on the podcast. And it always seems like you know DNA is mapped. Recently, they mapped, like I think, the brain or something. And so I, I was very much not aware that we're so early at the beginning. Uh, how come you feel, you know, it's 2022, we're still not there? Like, what has happened? I feel like especially those senses would have been mapped at this and that's, point. That's uh, like, I question that too. I mean, it's a brilliant question. Uh, and why are we not there? I think also sometimes it's just some areas of science are just ahead because there's been more focus in those areas. And... Well, one thing too is that it's just hard to study the sense of taste and the sense of smell. You need to have stimuli, so that's what I call the scientific term of just having a food, you know. So you need stimuli and you need to control them precisely. So the dosage, the timing, the concentration, right? And, and there it's much easier with visual stimuli. That's showing it on a screen and you know precisely when it was there. You can turn it off again. With the smell, you can't just turn it off immediately. And you can't just have an onset immediately, right? The concentration sort of rises and flows. So you really need quite a setup. And it's quite uh, tedious too, to be honest, the setup. You need to have people in and you need to have this setup to control the stimuli. You need to record the data. So it's just a slow process. So I think that's why we're a little bit behind with the visual stimuli. In, in the more chemical stimuli, like the odor, that's chemical stimuli, with the taste, that's also chemical stimuli. How has uh, tech helped in, in this whole process? Has the tech evolved to like measure these things, sense these things, control these things, and how has it evolved in the last 20 years or 100 years? Tech is really helping, and it is, it is really accelerating this field now because we need to understand how we taste and how we smell, it's, it's, it's fundamental, right? So I think a good way to illustrate this is one of the, again, we need to control how much do we eat when we study the taste response to understand it. And in 1971, the, this was the first study on taste responses in the brain done by EG. And what they did was to have a tablespoon and then they tip that over and sugar would land on your tongue and they would measure the response. So as you can see, this is not super precise uh, you also have the touch, right? So you don't just have the taste response. So now you have these huge gustometers that can control the, the taste stimuli precisely, concentration, how much sprayed onto the tongue so you have a large surface area that is covered so you can measure the brain response. But also recently, with the new data mining techniques, we are really getting ahead now because with all the electrodes measuring the brain response, we can now look at all of the sensors and looking at the patterns across the sensors and not just one sensor at a time, which was what one typically did 20 years ago during data analysis. And, and so all this data that you're gathering, what are you using it for? Like, how does it further your research? Are like patents coming out of it, products coming out of it? Like, what have you worked on that we can see in the world already? So, so far it's, um, it's about, so, so we are an ingredient company. So, so far it's about understanding what value does our ingredients bring. So if I can, if I can describe how 
uh, this mixture of ingredients will increase uh, arousal, right? This is something that energizes you. Or on the contrary, this is something that is disgusting. People might not say it is. Um, like one, one, one classical example I usually um, explain this with is that, well, if you ask people whether they want to buy plant-based, they might say they want to. Um, and say it's delicious because they want to seem on top of things and uh, and going with the flow. But, but when we then actually measure the response, we might see something else. So the value we're adding is to not only rely on the self-report, so what people say they're going to buy, or what people say they experience, but also actually measure it. You, you've probably also tried this, you know, asking a friend how they are, and they say they're doing fine. But you can just see that there's something else going on. So sometimes uh, it's hard to understand what you're experiencing yourself. It's easier to see from the outside. So can we capture some of that information and add to our products? Well, that is going to create real value. I, I wonder, considering all the research and everything you just explained, uh, wouldn't your research be super useful for weight loss programs? Uh, where you could actually see whether people are enjoying the food and then instead of having these these huge cheat days at the end of the week because the willpower <laughs> is gone it just like I don't know it's fe it feels like everything you're doing it would be so much it would contribute so much to the current weight loss protocols all over the world all the fitness and dietitians uh, and I just don't see well maybe I'm not looking of course but I feel like when I look at the general knowledge of dietitians and fitness trainers just this does not come anywhere close and it feels like what from what you're telling me would be super mm -hmm. useful and i think it depends a bit on, on on why there is overweight there's probably several reasons and not just the the pleasure sometimes it's just a habit that evolves it's not because you and that's actually an important distinction between what you like and what you want and those things might not be the same so you might want something even though you don't actually like it, but it's just become a habit. And But I guess if I'm looking at myself, right, especially during this whole period, I gained a couple of uh, kilos. And uh, I notice with myself um, when I'm losing weight, most of the struggle is in um, I have to cut the things that I'm enjoying from my food, like Ben and Jerry's tastes amazing and I have to cut that out but I feel like and I'm cutting it out for like carrots which again like I, I do but you know once a week it tends to not go so well uh, but so if you use your data you'd be able to manipulate the carrot in such a way that it tastes more like cookies I guess if we're going really crazy with science that's the dream scenario <laughs> yes yeah but but so isn't it possible that you then use that research and then look at, okay, well, th these are the things that are getting triggered when this person eats Ben and Jerry's. How can we help trigger these same emotion or same things in the brain when this person eats a carrot? It seems like it would be such a valuable multi-billion industry figuring that yeah. out. No, I, I totally agree. And that is, that is part of the dream. So I think carrot to cookie... We're talking, that's the future, right? But uh, f that was one of the papers we published, which was, okay, many steps before carrot to cookie, but that was the brain response to sugar, which is generally something everyone likes, white table sugar. And then the brain response to aspartame and a mixture of aspartame and acetylflame K. So both are um, non-caloric sweeteners. And the idea was exactly as you say, can we look at what is the brain response to sugar? What is the brain response to the sweetness? And then we have some kind of objective criterion to what is it it takes to become closer to the brain response to sugar. So what can we do to, to mimic that better? So now we have, we could see that, that the mixture gave a brain response that was more similar to the brain response to sugar. So we have an objective criterion here saying, well, we are closer to the brain response to sugar if we do a mixture of the sweetness. And, and of course, that's just a pilot study, right? But the general idea applies. Well, when was that study done? Because that, that, that's actually much more relevant, I think, than the carrot cookie comparison. The different sweeteners being able to step away from sugar, so relevant. When was this study done? I think it was published in 19. So 
so three years ago. Okay, about so it's a while time. ago. Uh, a couple of questions around that. Super fascinating. My first question is: I finally have a food scientist on the podcast. What is your take on sugar? What do you think of it? Is it? I feel like it's like a legit, like a drug almost that is legal, like tobacco and stuff like that, or nicotine. Am I uh, making sense when I say that? Uh, like, what is what does the science? Yeah, say? there's a lot of opinions out there. Well, my take on it is that um, that that from a science perspective, sugar works in a very different manner than than drugs and it's sometimes i see it in the media that those two are compared and and that is i think a misdoing so drugs they work work chemically in the brain whereas sugar works because it gives pleasure and thereby it it create could create a habit but that's very different from a drug which directly affects how the neurons transmit their signals to each other right sugar doesn't do that sugar just increases the pleasure for some people, and that might create a habit. But saying that, water could create a habit too, and you could become addicted to water, um, right? So, so in my opinion, that's where we are. But again, it's it's not what I do uh, as, as a scientist. Um, uh, so I think I'll leave it at that. No, I just, I definitely wanted, outside of that, I also wanted to ask another one about the sweeteners, but... Uh, that was important, I guess, for me to know, because then it's much easier. Because uh, if you Google it, it's like you hear everything. So now we actually have a scientific uh, opinion on it. Uh, other question, you mentioned aspartame. This is a widely discussed uh, part as well. I heard very, very bad stuff about aspartame. I've been avoiding it for pretty much since I've heard it 10 years ago. Um, you mentioned it. What is your take on aspartame? Do you really feel that is a legit allowed... Uh, replacements to sugar what is your opinion about it I think this one I'm staying out of so this is really not my area of, of expertise okay no worries. diplomatic answer <laughs> uh, cool then uh, about what, what you're doing of course uh, the ingredients so currently as you're doing your research what does your company like help doing with these ingredients are getting discovered do they sell it? I, I can only imagine they're selling it to like a Mondelez or something like that, to corporates who are working in foods, trying to get less calorie dense food. Like what is the research actually being applied for in daily lives of people? Yeah, and, and that's really where we're heading, I also have to say, because this is like, as I've said, that we have published on this. This is state of the art. So we, I think we've really, um, we really trying to push the barrier of current sensory science here. So this is not just uh, something easy. We've, we've really started on, on the deep end here. And, and now it's about how do we then apply it in, in our science. So I think there's, there's two important elements. One element is, can we understand the sensory processing? So for example, mimicking the, the sugar sensory response. And then there's the very, very different element, which is the emotional response. Can we, can we uh, create ingredients or mixtures of them that creates a certain emotion? How would you do that? Yeah, that's, that's where we're heading, right? But, but disgust is an emotion, an important emotion in, in the food science, right? So what we can do is that we can measure emotions because we are showing emotions all the time. Facial expression is a good example where you, you know how surprise looks and how disgust looks. And, and we have so many fantastic algorithms these days to unlock facial expressions. Think of your phone when you unlock it with the facial ID, right? So we are able to live while the consumer consumes a product to observe the emotional output on the face. And I mean, you are consciously able to control it, but there are also elements where you just react unconsciously. And we are able to capture that and to link that up to what you've just eaten to then document, well, what is the emotional effect of this and this ingredient? But you're saying all these things and the only thing I'm thinking of is how relative like tastes are. Like I 
have the palate of a five-year-old and my girlfriend is like this foodie who likes all, all the weird foods that I don't like <laughs> so so how how can you you know we're, we're not tracking colors here red is red blue is blue like we're tracking things that I like or don't like and then you know somebody else likes and doesn't like so how how do you do that and that's actually I'm, I'm very glad you say that because it's an important distinction we, we sort of sense things the same way but when we talk about liking it's day and night and 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 you know also just for me if I eat something uh, I for example I don't particularly like chocolate in the morning but in the afternoon I like it and if I have some past experiences with a product uh, I might not like a product so definitely it's about individualizing the the offerings for customers and this is also part of what needs to be understood more how about cultures uh, because there are some general effects of, of cultures too and what we like and what we don't like but as you say we're all different too so the question is can we one day individualize 100 percent and and we know what you like what i like we're not there yet so pretty much what you're imagining in the future is like every household would have this device that you click a couple of buttons with your preferences and then a certain food comes Yeah, or out. maybe even we understand your preferences already. So you can just ask it for something. I mean, we're talking way out here, but I love to dream, right? And, and look at where could this potentially go? Yeah. Uh, how many... You know, scientists are busy with this. If you're so early in the research, it, it seems like such a huge untapped market. And yet it's so slow and beginning. So, you know, how many people are busy with this? How far in the future are we talking about all these visions? Well, I think um, I don't know, to be honest, how, how many are engaged in the area. I know there are several scientists and more and more. Uh, I can also say when I started my doctorate, uh, so that was, again, that was electroencephalography on the taste responses, there were 20 published papers. That's approximately none, right, in the whole of the scientific world. But, um, but when I ended, it had doubled, I think. So, so it is increasing and there's more and more focus on it. Uh, but it, it was a bit uphill. I, I remember it was hard to find when I had to publish, it was hard to find reviewers because there weren't really any people in the field. Um, that said, there are also other brain scanning mechanisms like fMRI, PET, etc. They are just, when we're talking about industrial research, they are a bit more difficult to get at because an fMRI is not just something you have at a company. And that's really also why we, we looked at EEG back then. It is lightweight, it is unobtrusive, it doesn't require medical personnel to operate. Um, so it's also how you look at it, depending on, on what we're looking at. It, but in the in industrial world, I think we're seeing more and more people who are engaging in this area. Um, if you had you know, access to all the tech in the world or, or people who are building businesses, you know, let's say through this podcast, uh, what kind of like startups would you want to see come in this space to you know further your research and make it go faster or pra you know s take your research and make it practical what type of startups would you want to see founded data analysis is one thing and i think there's a lot of untapped solutions there uh, we have, um, it's only recently, I think, within the 10 years that we actually started using multivariate pattern anal analysis. And that sounds ridiculous because it's such an obvious method to look at the brain responses. And one thing one also can with all these, with the EEG, you can actually source localize activity in the brain. But this is still something that needs to be developed more. It's still it's still the popular opinion is still that you need to go to fMRI if you want to know where the precise location is of the brain activity. But there is a lot of information in the EG. You can be quite precise. So I think part of what we need to understand is 
um, what taste receptors are actually important and relevant when we uh, when we eat how are they different between people which might also explain why we like different things we might actually perceive things differently and we need to understand how the brain actually perceives these products and then why why we where we see these interactions we do between the different senses. One thing that is more and more up and coming is the electronic tongue. I don't know if you've heard of no. no so that? that's that's trying to to take our let's say our tongue and, and making an instrument that can tell us the same things uh, as a human would do. So to have a sort of a, a screening method, you can give that electronic, it looks nothing like a tongue, but you give it your, your solutions and then it tells you which one is the sweetest, which one is sour, which one. But in, even in this field, so there's still room for lots of startups, I would say, because that area is still not, we still don't have the perfect solution there. And, and people are by far the best to ask if you want to know what taste quality we're talking about but that that is a growing area too what, what would the practical benefit be of a tongue like that an electronic tongue well it would um so whenever you're dealing with human participants in a sensory panel it does take a bit of time right because you need people in and you need to to actually conduct the trial whereas an electronic tongue can run overnight and you can also with an electronic tongue, you don't need as much sample material. So it's a fantastic screening method uh, to understand would this be a, a solution that um, lessens the bitterness, for example, if you have an enzyme. You could screen different uh, types of enzymes. You could see which one gives uh, the, the most reduction in bitterness. Clear. So if a startup would be starting up today looking into those things to process data faster and better in ways like an electronic tongue would be actually an untapped market. That's amazing. Um, then I guess a question, um, sometimes I, I watch like these, you know, cooking classes on YouTube or something from like a Gordon Ramsay. And the thing that you notice when you watch like these Michelin chefs is that they're pretty much like these normal people that just develop their palate and tasting buds to a point where it's like, you know, like an Olympian almost. So it, it's, to me, it feels like it's a skill. They're learning, they're developing their taste skill. Um, ha when Whenever you did re research, have you ever reached out to a very good chef and had done research on how they developed their taste buds and, and then used that data for your research? No, actually not. But it is a super interesting research question. So what is happening with these people that are trained very much? Is it actually something in the brain that changes? Is it just that they are more attentive to the signals in their brain? Uh, but something similar we did was having ordinary people in, so not chefs. And then we measured how how able they were to differentiate. That was actually in the sugar study I mentioned before. How, to what degree they were able to discriminate the sugar and the sweetness. And then we actually found that the people who are more able to discriminate these samples consciously, we could also see that the brain had more different responses to the samples, right? So there might be a link there that it's actually just their sensory system that that is better at detecting the differences. The reason I ask is because one of the things that you said, you know, that tech could help is to pinpoint closer to what an fMRI would do instead of what an EEG would do. Um, so I guess the real innovation would be to get the technology of an fMRI into like the people's hands. Um, but until then, w would there be an option where you get, you know, you do a research uh, where you have multiple types of people, you know, someone who's just like an average person, someone who's a chef and someone who's like the like great chefs, like three star Michelin or I don't know, whatever the 
the level you would give them I'm, I'm not a chef of course so but then wouldn't you then maybe be able to pinpoint um with the average person a general area with the chef an even more localized area and then with this the great chef like even you know more focused in their brain or does that not work that way yeah i'm afraid it doesn't work that way but we can't know and this is still some research that needs to be done why are chefs better at discriminating you know different stimuli so i think that that's still still an, an open question but uh, actually and very relatedly we have what is called super tasters in in the sensory science world so that's a very common term and I think there's a lot of confusion about that because super tasters really just relates to your ability to taste bitter. And that's because we have, there are about 25 different bitter receptor types, right? And some people might have more and some people might have less. And some people that have more, they're called super tasters. And then sometimes we see in the literature that, that super tasters... Um, will then be regarded as better at tasting. But that's actually not it, right? And, and when, we, when we have sensory panels, we're not actually too interested in having super tasters. We're interested in how does the common person taste food? Um, yeah. How, how do you know if you're a super taster? Is that something yeah. someone it's, can it's find It's a out? quite specific product, uh, POP, P-R-O-P, that you, uh, if you can taste the bitterness of that, you're a super taster. Pop? And where do you get this product? That's a good question. You can purchase it. Um, Is it like a common product on Amazon? Yeah. You can? But also you can... Caffeine, for example. People will also have different uh, sensitivity to caffeine. What I'm just saying is that if you're better at detecting the bitterness, I think it's maybe it's, it's, um, it's a misleading word to say that you're then a super taster, right? Because there are also other taste qualities. The super taster only refers to this bitterness, but it maybe does explain why some people, they hate cabbage because cabbage is quite bitter. And if you are very sensitive to bitter, then that might be too much if you are a super taster. So, so pretty much my five-year-old palate, I can now tell my partner is because I just, I taste all the bitterness in the caffeine and the, and the cabbage and stuff like that. That's why I don't like it. <laughs> that That's actually, I think, a different part again but again super interesting which is that by tasting so as young people we need to learn the bitterness because innately we we think of bitter as something uh, poisonous because many poisons they taste bitter so it's something we're born with we, we learn that that bitterness is something we should probably avoid but as you also say if you repeatedly try to taste something bitter like cabbage if you try it again and again you will learn to appreciate it over time but it does require that repetition so it's not your receptors changing it's 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 you mentally changing by trying things again and again but it seems then to be an endless fight this research in food science because you i thought it was just some senses you localized it in your brain but now you're telling me it's also a learned skill. It could be different throughout time. If you're young and you're old, it's different. So how are you going to ever figure it out then? <laughs> um, over time, I'm sure we will we'll come far. And, and I'm, I'm optimistic because in the, in the past recent years, as you've seen already and heard already, we have made significant advances. I'm sure it will come, but it's it's this. I think there's a reason why, also especially with the taste and smell that we're behind, it's just so incredibly difficult. Even if you think about, you know, I want to measure the brain response to a taste. Well, how do I do that? How do I? We in science we love to have just one variable. So I only want the taste response. Well, that's nearly impossible because I need that physical product to touch my tongue, and then you have the touch sensation, which is something else which is also processed in the brain quite close to where taste is processed. So how do I know what was touch and what was taste? So lots of challenges and difficulties, which also explain why we, are, we still have a lot of open, open questions today. What are you, 
I'm not a food scientist, so my my question is, I guess, like, what would you like to share that people like me don't know about that is happening right now in the food science industry? Well, I think um, one of the things is understanding just the fundamentals of how we sense food is actually still ongoing, and I think if if I were to say anything today, that's probably the most uh, important thing uh, to understand, that this is still an evolving science and a science where we still need to understand a lot. And then it's really to, to localize, uh, understand how we, we sense food, not just smell and taste right. That's just where, where, where I've been the most. But also understanding how they interact, uh, which is then another complication, right? But... Um, that that's where science is today. How? I guess my question is: How easy is it to get funding when it's so vague? I again, I I wasn't aware it was so early stage because I saw startups, I saw all these molecular gastronomies happen, and and now you're telling me, and it all makes sense, of course, that it's so early because it's so complicated. But you know, how can you get funding for this? How can you start? things in this space if if it's so vague well i think it's it's uh, it's an i think it's a beautiful beautiful argument in itself that we don't know very much so so telling that to funding agencies that this is really an area where we need to understand more and that with little funding we actually can understand something fundamental and not just some detail out out here right uh, so i think that and then also uh, arguing that Understanding our sensation of food is going to help us in the obesity epi epidemic, I'm sure. Uh, in the, in, but also just in general nutrition, if we can align nutrition and good taste, I'm sure it's, it's going to be easier for people to, to follow a healthy diet. I feel like the research that you're conducting has been very much used also in these uh, meat replacements uh, because the tastes at the beginning were, I mean, let's be honest, was horrible. And now, you know, we eat the Beyond Meat burgers and they're really great tasting. Um, do you feel like what 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 is actually happening there? Is it they're just adding certain things like flavors or something or they're fundamentally changing something based on the research that people like you work on it's it's a mixture of several things i think it's 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 um well the thing is if you if you are making a pea-based burger it's gonna taste of pea um, and people say they want to taste uh, want like the taste of plants and and want to buy plant-based but the the thing is do they now actually like are they actually interested in that or do they just say they they like plant-based and we have some studies suggesting that that we're inclined to say that we we like plant-based but but when it comes to it we don't really and and we don't like the taste of pea so a lot of the research is also about well how do we then minimize and reduce that pea off taste then because people actually don't want it and that's where, where things are improving. And that's actually where IFF comes in with, with products to, uh, to modify off tastes, reduce them, and also adding other flavors that can also help minimize that off flavor. So I think it's, it's a mixture of several things that have really helped us to understand what is it the consumer actually wants, and then how can we do that? I guess a question that goes to that that always pops up in my mind when I'm passing places like a McDonald's or something like that is um, they've really manipulated the tastes of the burger. Like this isn't like, you know, if you eat McDonald's, you're not going to be very healthy. Let's be honest. There's been many documentaries on this, um, but they've manipulated the taste to a point where, you know, everybody wants a Big Mac. So I guess my question is when you're conducting research like that and you're changing the taste of a specific like product um doesn't that kind of like manipulate the taste buds but i guess what i'm trying to say is humans you know they taste for a reason they want certain ingredients in their mouth because it will feed their body they they are deficient that's why you're craving it but when you're manipulating the you know the tastes and the flavors 
then you you're giving a stimuli to your brain like oh you know you got this in your body except you didn't get it um, and suddenly you're deficient in something that you should have actually just eaten but now you got the flavor doesn't that mess with that or do i just not understand how it works no, i think that's that's what we talk about when we talk about empty calories that, that we get the sugar without any of the nutrition, whereas that you could also have gotten the sugar from a fruit where you'd also get vitamins, right? So that wouldn't be as empty as just eating table sugar. So that is definitely something, but I think this also, it, it's more nuanced than that. And so when we talk about sugar, it's not like people just love sugar and the more sugar, the better. If you get to a certain concentration of sugar, it starts tasting bitter. And you actually don't like it. That's also again back to the is sugar a drug? Uh, whereas drugs, the more the the better, right? But but it doesn't work like that with foods. And you actually have certain consumer segments. Um, we call them. We have sweet likers, but we also have sweet dislikers. Where if you add sweetness, they'll actually dislike it more, right? So it's not one solution fits all, and you can just add fat and sugar and empty calories, and people would would like it better. Yeah, makes sense. Um, well, when you guys are conducting the research, is it very much like you said, you're focusing on the senses and the tastes and, and flavors? and Or are you also focusing on the health aspect of it? Does that get included in your research? Um, not in my particular research. But of course, n the nutritional aspect is one that we, we can consider too in, in, the, in, in the company. But where I am, it's about understanding what the consumer wants for the flavor and, and for the texture and trying to match that expectation. How did you get to, I should have probably asked this at the beginning, but how did you get to this point? I mean, we're 40 minutes in the podcast. <laughs> Where <sorry>. am I? <laughs> but so, you know, what, what was it that triggered you to, to learn this? It's such a niche, you know, kind of thing. So vague, so early. Uh, and you yet want to be a pioneer. Like, where did it start and how did you get here? Well, I think I'm not really the pioneer. The The pioneer was my, my previous manager who was in sensory science. Uh, she headed the the department I come from. And she so she had this sensory panel. They come in several days a week, right? We give them food products and we ask them, what do they think? Is this sweeter than this one, etc., right? Understanding what our ingredients can do. And what she kept seeing was that sometimes the panel struggled explaining what the difference was. Like back to the, the light versus uh, calorie version of a product. What is the difference actually? Um, studies uh, show that, that when we ask um, people what the difference is between a, a light soda and a calorie calorie version then they would say that the the light one is more flat or it's colder or it's it's less uh, it's thinner and and the thing is though they have almost the same viscosity and it, it there's certainly no difference in temperature so our panel are trying to describe what they perceive with words that just don't add up. It's because this, it's incredibly hard to articulate what we experience. So this was one of the things she saw and saw that there was a need to be, to get a bit earlier in the process. So before it becomes conscious to understand what was it that led to this conscious experience? Where is it that the, the light soda suddenly changes what is it in the brain that's detected because it's we can't study it with us humans with self-reports if we can't explain what it is we're perceiving so that was the the main idea she had she then applied for funding and uh, got me in as a phd to work on this and then then the rest is history right but that's that's sort of how we ended up in this niche you could say which is now turning more and more mainstream as we go because more and more people now realize that yes we can't get it all by self-report importantly i just need to add though that self-report we're always going to need that we're not replacing self-report because if people say it's disgusting it's disgusting and nothing i can measure is gonna rule that out right and so uh, the before the phd and everything how did you get 
interested in this and how did you what did you study like was this something you wanted to do since you were a child was this something in your studies what did you study that got you to that phd i studied food science um and and you know and i got into food science because i went on a, after high school so i did a very scientific um uh, high school and um, afterwards i needed a break a gap year and well, I was 18, I needed to get as far away as from home as possible. So I looked at the, the globe. And then if you take Denmark and, and you look at the globe, then New Zealand is on the ex exact opposite side of the world. So I flew to New Zealand and I worked there for half a year on 10 different farms. Loved it. So thought, why not food science? So really, it's just, you know, um, just looking at w what I love to do. So I started in a food science education in, in Denmark. And then during one of our classes, we were out visiting different companies and we visited, that was DuPont at the time, where they were wanting to, to study brain science. And, and I think for many people, the brain and neuroscience, that's just so incredibly interesting. And I thought so too, I had been I'd been reading up on it on my own, just out of pure interest. And then when I saw that combination of doing neuroscience and food science at the same time, well, there was no way around it. I just needed to do it. Uh, how do you find a study like that? I mean, we're so early stage in food science. Was there a university that offered this or did you study something specific? Because I can imagine if my you know friend wants to go study he's not going to find food science on the curriculum and uh, no the the food science was the it's molecular nutrition and food science at Aarhus university it's a quite recent education uh, but just to say there there is no neuroscience uh, course on that um, program it's just food science and food technology so I've had that difficult transition into neuroscience, which is I have my food science background, right? But now I suddenly need to understand the brain, the neuroscience part. I need to understand sensory science and how we study consumer perception. And I need to understand how to program because you get so much data out of, out of the census. So they record 500 times per second. And I typically have 128 electrodes and I have a couple of hours of recording per participant, right? And then finding patterns in that data, that's just not possible from looking at, that, at the maps of the brain. We need more advanced machine learning to find them for me. So, so that means that in university, you studied molecular biology, you studied machine learning and neuro, neuroscience. Yeah, I, I had to. Yeah. My background was food science, but then uh, commencing on this PhD, I had to take on courses in, in various different areas because this is this goes across any discipline, and you just need to to continuously learn. And there's no degree that will get you to uh, a food science neuroscience area. It's it's a combination of many different branches. Yeah, makes sense. Um, we're actually getting really close to the end, but uh, before we, we get there, um, I, I always ask a question, which is, which books do you recommend? Uh, is there something where people can read up more on this, people who are interested looking to get into this area? Yes, I have just a book. And when you asked, how did I end up here? I think that was actually the book and that did that. It was a book by... It's a Danish author, so I'm going to say it in Danish now. Tor Nørre Tanners. Um, and I've... Mærk Verden is the Danish title. I'm sorry about that. And I don't know the exact... Feel the World is, is the direct translation, but he probably had a different title in English. Um, which explains how we are conscious and explains the consciousness, but also explains that this is such a small part of what we actually sense. Our brain detects so much more than what ends up in our conscious mind. So imagine that your, sen uh, your senses are active all the time. So if I right now, I ask you to be attentive to the touch of the chair that you're sitting on, 
then it comes up to your consciousness. It wasn't there just before, but your brain was still sensing it, right? The information was there all along, but it didn't get through to the consciousness. And, and I think that really helps understand how we sense the world, that we are only able to consciously relate to a very small fraction of it, and the fraction we actually experience is a highly um, interpreted version we don't experience the, the wavelengths of, of light. We don't experience molecules. I don't know what molecules they are. It's interpreted, and I just have a sensation of sweetness, whatever that is, right? It's quite ambiguous or, or sourness, but it all relates back to, to molecules. So um, I think that, that was really uh, the book uh, that, um, that has changed my thinking most. Nice. Do you, do you have any uh, last words for the people who are listening? Anything you'd want to encourage or uh, leave them thinking with? Um, maybe just to reiterate, we need to understand the sense of taste, the sense of flavor in general, much more. And that we are just in the beginning of this journey. And that I hope that many more players will come to the area and that we can really accelerate this this journey that we're on. I like that. I, uh, I'd love to roll out the red carpet for you. Where can people find you? You know, do you have any books to share, anything to promote? Please do so. Uh, I have a TED Talk that people are... Mm, that, that actually gives quite a good intro to the whole area, I think. Then, of course, there's some published papers if people are more interested but you can also see them on the tit web page actually so maybe that's a good entry point nice. yeah, i saw i saw that one it was really funny very anecdotal <laughs> um great i i thank you so much for uh, coming on the podcast sharing it um definitely recommend the ted talk it was really funny and, and very informative and uh for more information obviously people watch this podcast so thank you so much and uh yeah hopefully i'll see you in the next one thank you so much and thank you for your time if you like this episode you can check out our most recent one here and if you haven't already make sure you click here to subscribe and see the next one but if you're interested in more tips and tricks then make sure to join our facebook group where you can find thousands of like-minded people and you get direct access and support to any business question from the entire startup